stuff with the elements of uh, theory. I would say I would call it such a uh, sophisticated name like set theory. It seems a very difficult subject with the word theory attached. That's why almost the title like naive set theory is much better. All right. Um, last time we saw something about the arithmetic of cardinal numbers. <coughs> now I am. There is one important. What I mean, I mean, where you are heading is there is one important uh, theorem, which is not a theorem, uh, called the axiom of choice. Now I am heading for that. This has a very important role in analysis, algebra, topology. Wherever you go, many of the existence theorems of certain maximal elements are through uh, axiom of choice, but various versions of axiom of choice. Okay. So I am heading towards that. Uh, I may be sort of simply throwing in a lot of terminologies which many of you will be familiar with uh, and they are not difficult if you are not familiar with them. Uh, it's only a question of interpretation sometimes. So the first thing that I am going to talk about is what are known as relations. Okay? Because everybody knows. Everybody has at least one relation. And incidentally, empty relation is also a relation. So even if you don't have a relation, you have a relation. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so by a relation formally, let me uh, let me say what I mean. Okay. Uh, any subset of A cross B is called a relation from A to B. Where A and B are any two sets. If you take two sets A and B, any subset of A cross B is called a relation from A to B. It is very obvious. I mean, it is not a very difficult thing uh, to uh, understand. Okay? It is a formal way of writing the relation. So suppose R is a relation from A to B, then what does this mean? This means R is a subset of A cross B. And now therefore, it contains certain ordered pairs, the first element is ordered pair coming from A and the second coming from B. May not contain all the ordered pairs, some ordered pairs. So, if the ordered pair A B belongs to R, we say A is R related to B. So, sometimes we even write A or B. So, A or B does not mean B or A. So, you remember the direction in which it goes. Not in general, A or B does not mean B or A. Because A or B means going from A to B. B or A means coming from B to A. Even if A and B are same, still doesn't uh, matter. Uh, doesn't mean the same. If uh, I am brother of X, it doesn't mean X is brother of me. Okay, so there is a problem there. So we should be very very careful uh, with these things. So if A is, if this ordered pair is in A cross B, we say A is R related to B, or vice versa. If we have a wordly uh, 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 relation described uh, utility by words and if A is related to B, we say that ordered pair A B belongs to that R. Okay? These are various ways of uh, looking at it. Well, whenever you have such things, whenever you are talking about subset, there are two extremes. One is the empty set is certainly a subset of A cross B, subset of anything and therefore it should be a relation from A to B. So therefore, by each relation from A. And this is called the empty relation. And the other extreme is A cross B itself is contained A cross B. So the entire thing is a relation. Therefore, A cross B is a relation. 
So this we will call the universal relation. <coughs> the empty relation, nobody in A is related to anybody in B. In the universal relation, everybody in A is related to everybody in B. Somewhere in between lies the truth. All right. um, let me give some standard examples which we will be using later. Okay. The first thing, okay, let us look at some examples. You are not able to see the lower portion of the board or you are not able to see any part of the board. <laughs> lower portion. Below this, I will avoid writing. Okay. Examples one. Let's look at <coughs> let me write it in my proper corresponding notation. So let us consider all the ordered pairs in n cross r. Therefore, it is a subset of n cross r. So, it is going to be a relation from n to r. Over the related, any n is related to r, uh, a real number, if that real number is the square root of this n. So, for example, is a relation from n to r. For example, 2 is 2, 4, uh, the other way, 4, 6, <coughs> belongs to R, but 4, x, 8 does not belong because this R is not the square root of it, whether this R is the square root of it. Uh, so, for example, 3, Now, look at a similar thing, but now I will write this is again a similar uh, thing, it can be thought of as a relation from So, in, in this relation, every n is related to somebody in R, uh, in R, whereas in this relation, not every n in that is related to somebody in R. All the negative fellows have no relation, only non-negative fellows have relations. Okay. Uh, some of the very standard examples, we can take n uh, You take uh, uh, numbers with the less than or equal to order or equal to it is a relation from, I will just write from n to n. Whenever we have a relation from a set to itself, we will simply call it a relation on n. Okay, so from now on, with both the domain and codomain, if you want to call it relation from on n, we will call it a relation on or we can replace uh, this by x y belonging to r cross r so that x is this is a relation on r ok uh, one, uh, one one or two more examples let me just give it to you let x be any set, 
Px the power set of x. Then uh, is the relation of Px. <coughs> that is uh, to a set a subset of x is related to a subset of x if h and h is a subset of p. Okay. So, there are so many subsets. A subset of x is related to another subset of x where the first subset is a subset of the second subset. Uh, this is a, a slight uh, takeover from less than or equal to but not completely. I will just give you one more example. The problem is when you have any number of examples, any number of examples are there which are of interest. Okay. So, if you go on right answer, I will give one more example, I will give one more example. Okay. Every hand there is an n plus 1, let be almost axiom. I will give one more example. Okay. Anyway, uh, I lost count of the number. Uh, let us look at uh, the following relation. Function has several parts, the domain, the codomain, and the rule. 
uh, for a set. Okay. Suppose f is a function Oh, okay, let's uh, fast start with uh, the domain of f is contained in A and the co-domain of f is equal to A. I will use this notation. What does this mean? f is a function from domain of f to B where this domain of f is a subset of a. So, here is a, here is b, here is some subset of a called the domain of f. Now, f is a mapping from here. So, f is a function from this sub, some subset of a to b. Now, once you have such a function, with every function we have the graph. What is the graph? It is a subset of domain of cross B, but that is also a subset of A cross The graph G of F is points in the graph, collect it, it is a point in, this is a subset of domain f cross b, I will write uh, from now on uh, domain f d f, which is since d f is contained in this. So, I can interpret this as a relation from a to b. So, if I have a function with, which is uh, from a subset of a, to B, I can interpret it as a subset of A cross B through its graph and hence I can interpret it as a relation from A to B. So, every function F whose domain is A and co-domain is B can be interpreted as a subset of A cross B through its graph. And hence, as a relation, because any subset of A cross B is a relation, as a relation from Functions. Because for a function we specifically need that every point here will have only a unique association there. Therefore, if, if you want to have a relation to be a function, a priori requirement is the requirement is that the first coordinate in each one of these, if you take a relation, it will be a subset of A cross B. Now, with the subset of A cross B, it consists of lot of ordered pairs. Now, every ordered pair is the first coordinate. The first coordinate but must appear exactly once. The same first coordinate should not appear twice. If it does appear exactly once, then that becomes a function. What becomes the domain? The domain becomes the collection of all the first coordinates. And of course, the order domain is still B because the second coordinates are all from so, therefore, we will use that terminology now for a relation. So, that suggests how to define the domain of a relation. For a relation R, I think I should not write to the, that level, I should be at higher level. Force must be at higher level. Uh, for any relation, R we define domain of R to be 
the set of all A belonging to A at the there is this B B that A belongs to. There is at least one relative. Collect all those fellows who have at least one relative. That's called the domain of the relation. Okay. So what we are saying is for a function, it should be a relation, but whenever somebody has a relative, he has only one relative. Exactly one relative. So, with this notation, a function <coughs> f mapping from g f containing a uh, to b uh, is a relation uh, from a to b in which every a in d f is exactly One B in B such that A B belongs to. I will learn the relation also, function also, all by the same notation. I do not mean here. First of all, when I say something, I must say what are all the things that I do not mean. Okay, I do not mean here that different A's go to different B's. What I am saying is every A must have only one relative. The same fellow may be relative to several fellows. Okay. So it may be one too many function. What in the world index is to be called as one too many function. But it should not be a many to one function. That we do not want. Okay. Every A must have exactly at every point the function has exactly one value. Okay. Otherwise we can't draw the graph. We are confused. It is like when we ask somebody to do an experiment. We had all done experiments in our college days. Everyone gets a different value. Okay. If somebody tries to plot the graph, he is in soup. Okay. So his graph has a completely different meaning altogether. So what they do is, uh, yeah. we, we all know what they are taking about. <laughs> you fudge, you cheat, you, you do whatever you want, finally produce a graph. This gets you marks. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so basically the, what I want to interpret is that every function can be interpreted as a relation. Okay. Then now let us <coughs> take two sets here. Let me make some notations. Suppose I have two sets A and B, two A and B are little sets.
domain of f containing domain of g. It may happen that these two have nothing to do with each other. Their intersection may be empty, or they may have part common and other part not common, or one may sit completely inside this other. We first look at whether D of is contained in D G. Suppose yes. Then what it says is F takes, okay, uh, then the picture will look like this. This will be D G, inside will be D F because this D F can end in D G. Then F takes you from here to there and G takes you from there. Now in this portion, both F and G are taking things to. So now we ask the next question: Is if A equal to G A for every A belonging to T A? If the answer is yes, what have we got? G is an extension of. Then G is an extension. Then G is an extension. Now, with this understanding, therefore, we now now there is a reverse way. We can say F is a restriction of G. We can either say that G is an extension of F, or F is a restriction of G. Okay. Uh, we can also say F is a restriction of. G. Okay, so now we have this. We define this relation. We take all such functions, and we say that f is related to G if uh, G is an extension, which we write from now on. This is the notation we we'll use for the fact that G is an extension of F. We'll write F subset. This same notation is used. The reason is what? Why we use that notation? If we interpret F as a set, what set? The, the, the subset of A plus B, and G as a set, and if G is an extension of F. This set will be contained in that set, and therefore we use the same notation because we many times look at F in this or in the form of set. So if you look at the two functions in the form of set theoretic uh, interpretation, then this set will be a subset of this. So actually the uh, subset relation we introduce forces a relation among function. That is the extension relation. Okay, or a restriction <coughs> relation. F is a restriction. So this is a relation on. I will just for the heck of it, which well as I will use, therefore, which I may use uh, very shortly in the next class or something, if necessary. Uh, in the following, we could also look at, let's call it as one, and call it as R O. Next, another relation on the same set. We will use the following notation. F O of A B or not of A B to be exactly the same idea, but something addition is going to be asked for. So I am not going to take all such functions, but among these functions, I am going to pick some of them. What are the one one functions? Okay, all one one functions. So it is the set of all F. In F A B, such that F is one one. So now, what does it mean? Every fellow will have exactly one relative. Distinct fellows will have distinct relatives. This is what I am saying. One one. If F A equal to F B, then A must be equal to B. That's what is we are saying. 
So we look at all the one one functions, and uh, now if you look at, I'll just write f not cross f not all these I will not write uh, such that. That is also a relation. What would happen <coughs> if G also in F naught, its restriction will also be one one, or if you take a restriction and extend it is one one, that is also one one. So either way, you go back and forth, there will be one one function showing. We could look at such restricted classes of functions. And again, look at the extension uh, extension relation. And that will be a relation. These are all useful things when we prove certain uh, existence theorem, certain results about uh, uh, what shall we say, uh, cardinalities, cardinal numbers, their arithmetic, and so on and so forth. These are all the things that are uh, useful. And we also be useful as looking at several versions of the action of choice. Okay. Mm. Now I want you to observe one thing here. Suppose. Just one remark, one observation, which will be useful. <coughs> Suppose I take a function. What does that stand for? I have a. Inside that, there is a small subset which I will call as the domain of f, and I have b, and is going from here to here, and it's a one-one function. I'm not saying one-two; it's just one-one. So I have f, which is a one-one function from a subset of A to B. Now the moment I have a function, I can interpret it as a set, as a set, as a subset of A cross B. So f can be interpreted as, s is interpreted as G f which is a subset of A. Now, therefore, this is a set. GF is a set. Now, once I have a set, I can look at each subset. So, what does it mean to say that I am looking at a subset of GF? I am taking a restriction of M. Okay. So, a subset of GF Because we are looking at only a sum of the x's, that means the domain has been reduced. And then again, the second part gives us the function. So, a subset of GF gives rise to a restriction of okay. Now that restriction will also be one one. Okay, so which is also in and this is also this restriction is also a one one function. And hence this restriction belongs to A B I will not. So if we take a function which is in F naught A B any restriction will be in F or any subset of F will be in F naught A. In particular, all finite subsets of F will be in F. That is one thing which I want you to note. Note that all subsets, all finite subsets of F, that is GF will be okay. All subsets will be there, in particular all finite subsets will be there. This is one thing which uh, I want you to know because I am going to very specifically use the fact that all finite subsets are there. Now what does this finally boil down to? If we have a one one function from this to this, take any finite subset of this and the corresponding map 
that will also be a one month. That's all. It's a very simple thing, but it has to be stated in the abstract way for its application. If you take any function like this and just take only a finite number of points on that graph and take that as a new function, it is like you, you my favorite word, you have a signal, you discretize it. Okay? If that signal was one to one, at different points with a different uh, whatever you want to call it, values, then if you take the discretized version, that will also be one. That's all I'm trying to say. And in particular, as we can only do as uh, simple human beings, we will sample only at finite number of points. Okay. So therefore, if you take a finite number of points, and still that one one mess will be made. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay. What I'm trying to say, it's not that bad a word. There is some justice in this word. Okay. It's still do a simple observation. In fact, there is a this whole idea of uh, set theory. There is a uh, there is a, a branch called extremal set theory, which is a very uh, very well organized subject, uh, particularly among combinatorial design theorists, etc., etc. And uh, sets with such several types of such structures are very important. In fact, if we have not necessarily this. If you say have any collection of, in place of F0, if we have any collection of sets which have the property that when somebody belongs there, all his finite subsets belongs there, that is called a collection of finite character. I will make the formal definition next time uh, before when I go to uh, axiom of charts. Okay? So that is a, a very simple thing. Uh, it is just in, in, in a common sense language, I have a big function which is 1 1. What is meant by 1 1? If you draw a horizontal line, it will intersect at exactly one point. That is all the one one function is. You draw the graph, you draw any horizontal line, it may not intersect, that means that value is not taken. If it intersects, it will intersect exactly at one point. So, if you have such a uh, this thing and you, you sample at a finite number of points, the discretized version will also be a same property. You will draw a horizontal line, it will intersect that discrete uh, signal, or it may not intersect the discrete signal. If it intersects, it will intersect exactly at one of the sample values. That is all it says. Any questions? Did you all get it? Yes. Something yes. strange happened. I marked a copy for myself. I did not get it. So, I started wondering whether uh, you all got it or not. So, so maybe the computer is very smart. He said, this guy already has a copy in his <laughs> thing. Why <laughs> am I it? So, I am wondering whether I reach anybody. Okay. Um, of course, the one uh, last Monday's lecture was not there. Only the first three were there. So, last Monday's and this Monday's are not catch up there. Okay, uh, would everybody get to, you have got a decent copy of the PDF file, I mean if there are any, did any of you have any problems? No problems. Well, I think I, where is Arvind? He was giving full credit, he really worked hard. He, he made me work hard. <laughs> and uh, anybody who is capable of doing it must be really great. <laughs> so I am a lazy fellow. I told him many times I am a lazy fellow. He challenged, how can you be a lazy fellow sort of thing. He made me uh, really 
Well, thanks to him. Okay. He's really doing a good job. So, somebody may, in the, it's in Institute's tradition, when somebody does a good job, let him do more jobs. Okay. <laughs> 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 No, I mean this game for it. Right, okay. Now who are the, the so-called uh, suppose R is a relation on SAT. So now we are going to specialize relation from A to A. Okay. Relations on a given set. But I am just going to write terms, they are all self-explanatory. We say that R is one reflexive if AA belongs to R for every A. That is everybody is related to himself. First you must be selfish <laughs> to make uh, any progress. Okay. So everybody is selfish. Okay. Selfishness, A is Related to be, A is selfish with respect to B. He is in fact selfish over himself. It is called symmetric if AB belongs to R, if and only if B belongs to R. And it is called anti symmetric. The violation of this. Okay, anti-symmetric if AB belongs to R and BA belongs to R, the only time that it can happen, if at all it happens, it can happen only when mm -hmm. A goes to And it is called uh, transitive <coughs> if AB belongs to R and BC belongs to R implies A is related to B, B is related to C. <coughs> we tell us if A tells all secrets to B and B tells all secrets to C, which is as good as A telling all secrets to C. <laughs> Only thing is, it should not be distorted on the day. We add some masala. <laughs> These are all mathematical fellows, they are very precise, even when they tell secrets. Alright, uh, you must remember that all these are different things. You can have a relation which is reflexive but not symmetric, etc., etc. You can have a relation which is symmetric but not as and so on and so forth. It is not that one you can get one. There are certain temptations. Many times you can come and say, this implies that, and that's not true. For example, if we had this, A, B, we are symmetric. Then by transitivity it should say A R A, it is reflexive in a spots. Okay. It is an equal, let me not get it. So then I am doing another course on this grid. This is, is a... Is example like it is reflexive, reflexive but not anti-symmetric. Exercise. <laughs> 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 exercise. Not difficult at all. So all you have to do is throw in, you have to manipulate with the subsets. If you want reflexive, you want all the diagonal elements. Put them all there. If you want to kill anti-symmetry, put one fellow who kills it. Okay? Construction of the examples are very simple. Okay? Take two sets, take a set A, take the A cross A. If you want reflexive, all the diagonal elements A, A must be there. Put them. If you want to kill any one of them, you put some more fellows who you violate one of those, whichever rule you want to violate. That's not at all difficult construction. Okay, there are two important things in this. One, the type of relations which have 1, 2 and 4, and the type of relations which have 1, 3 and 4. These are, in fact, the, both are of great importance, relevance in uh, all analysis algebra. So, a relation on A, which is reflexive, <coughs> symmetric, and transitive is called an equivalent solution. Okay? 
Now, we'll see sometime. I will quickly go through later, I'll come to influence relations later, uh, though I shaped it first. Uh, basically, I think almost all of mathematics, classical or even modern mathematics in a sense, has been uh, in the following. Any given collection of objects, whether they are geometric in nature, algebraic in nature, arithmetic in nature, somehow can be, with respect to certain relations, can be grouped into different equivalence classes. Every equivalence relation gives rise to partitioning the set into several equivalence classes. And uh, the subject matter is, if you study one representative from each one of these equivalence classes, your subject is over. Okay? And the next, uh, basically over, and therefore, the B, B being lazy, we would like to pick that representative who is easy to study. Okay? So therefore, uh, if somebody says, definitely all the following three questions are going to appear in the exam, and one of them you have to answer, what do you do? You <laughs> pick the easiest one and read, isn't it? So that's why, that's exactly what we are going to do. Uh, that's actually has been all of, uh, uh, all of mathematical structuring theorems. Mm -hmm. Or somehow or the other, divide everything into equivalence classes. What is the best uh, canonical forms are the most simple representatives of each equivalence class. Okay. That's, uh, there will be certain numbers, certain properties which will all remain common to all those fellows in that they are called invariants and the study of invariants has been essentially all of them. Second, if it is reflexive, anti-symmetric and transitive, it is called a partial order relation. If somebody may ask, can a relation be both an equivalence relation and a partial order relation? Of course, my answer will be exercise. Find out the answer also. Okay. What is it? What is the only thing that is required? What is common is this. So, if a relation has to be both equivalence relation and uh, partial order, it has to be both symmetric and anti-symmetric. Can a relation be both symmetric and anti-symmetric? Only a comma iterable. Only a comma iterable. So, right. Here the answer you look at. The relation is diagonals. Okay? If, you, if you have relationship in which everybody is related to only himself, okay? absolutely selfish fellows, he doesn't want to give anything to everybody, anybody else. That's the relation which is both. Okay. Anyway, mm. so now we will concentrate on partial order relations first. Or equal to order, 
that is a partial order relation because every number is less than or equal to itself. If A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, then A is equal to B, that is anti symmetric. And if A is less than or equal to B, B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C, and therefore that is also transitive. So it is easy. And similarly, if you consider that on R or Q, anything, any set of numbers, the less than or equal to relation, any set of subset of real numbers, the less than or equal to is a, this or of is a poset. Uh, okay, from now on, now on partially ordered sets, we are going to learn lazy and lazy, uh, we will write it as posets. Okay. So, this is a poset. The second example is consider the set, so let x be any set. Px, uh, the power set. Then on that, if you look at the subset of that subset, because if A is contained in B and B, A is contained, A is a subset of itself, so reflexivity is okay. If A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, A equal to B. If A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, A is automatically a subset of C. So this is a virtual verification. So that is a possibility. Let us look at the natural number with the divisibility relation. Now clearly any number divides itself. A is one times A. Okay? So it is reflexive. If A divides B, and B divides A, not a positive integers, what can you say about A equal to this. Okay. And if A divides B and B divides C, certainly A divides C. Okay. So, these are all easy to verify, therefore it is, this is the positive. So, the natural numbers with respect to divisibility um, Now let us go back to our world notation. So of today, what does that stand for? The set of yes, set of all functions whose domain is a subset of A in coda minus B and what is this relation? F is related to B, F is related to G if f is a restriction of g or g is an extension of f and that is a because every function is an extension of itself okay and if this is an extension of that and that is an extension of this two domains coincide everything else also and then the rest of it this is essentially a set theoretic statement again. It is essentially the same statement in a completely different language. And similarly, if we take 1 1 functions with the same extension thing, that is a Example 1 for 
any a b in the process okay whether you take this process or this process or this process either a is less than or equal to b or b is less than or equal to a must hold we simply use the word that any two elements are comparable we say comparable if you can write a is related to b okay so this is a way of saying the law of trichotomy that is any two elements in these forces or comparable okay but if you look at example 2 let's take a very specific uh, situation let us take x to be say for example ab suppose i take x to be ab or not here let's say x1 x2 doesn't matter x1 x2 and then let's take what is px then count the empty set the single ten sets and the entire set now if i take so in this passage take a to be x1 and b to be x2 then neither a is related to b nor b is related to a so neither a is related to b not b is that is the law of trichotomy does not hold okay so it could happen that in some process any two of those are comparable but in some process some other process there may be two elements which are not comparable here of course if you take x1 and x1 x2 they are comparable so it may happen that some pairs are comparable some other pairs are not comparable for example here what happens in this process for example 5 and 7 are not comparable why 5 does not divide 7 and 7 does not what will happen here you carry over that set theory you can make the two domains be completely different and then they are not at all comparable means there is an extension of the other so here also not comparable uh, there are pairs of incomparable groups so we we now specialize we give a name for when something is there special some fellows have the special property if we have a process in which any two elements are comparable we call it a linearly ordered set that particular relation is called a linear order or total order okay so we give a definition a process is called a linearly ordered set or totally ordered some people call it process the totally ordered set the partially ordered set is process the totally ordered set is process it's called a linearly ordered set or if for every a b in p either a less than a Then we call it a linearly ordered set. Just giving all the terms that finally lead us to state zones, lemma, and things like that. Okay. I need eventually all these terms. Uh, there are several versions. They want to cover at least two or three of these. Like not proofs, but at least state. 
Okay. Um, now, if you have a partially ordered set, suppose I have a partially ordered set, <coughs> then you can take the subset of P and then use the same relation that will be again a so with the same relation, what I mean is the same idea of the relation. We are taking why we are going to take a subset of that relation. Okay. Then that will also be a possible. For example, if you take the this integers, where was that? It's gone. Uh, if you take only the even integers and use the same less than or equal to, that will be again a possible. Or if you take all the prime numbers and use that, that is again a possible. So the subset. Together, it is already hereditarily becomes a, it, it just acquires the property being part of that. So, that is a possible. Now, if you look at some of these which were not totally ordered sets, take for example, look at the divisibility, this possible. Now, this is not totally ordered. But look at <coughs> n1. Let's take all, let me call it n n2. Okay. Um, it's a sacrilege to call n2 without having an n1. Who says so? I don't know. Somebody simply wrote it thus that you have to start with n1. Now look at all those numbers which are powers of 2. So this is just 2 to the power of n where n belongs to z plus, because 0th power is also. So, look at all the powers of 2. Now, this is a subset of n, right. So, uh, so n1 is a subset of n2. n2, perhaps you see. n2 is a subset of n. Okay. Now, therefore, n2 is a person. Now, if you look at this person, this is totally out. Any two elements are compared. This is totally out. So, therefore, you may have. Oh, I'm sorry.
what is your relation then? If no two elements are comparable, what is the relation you are talking about? We are talking about the original relation of the poset. Pardon me? We are taking the original relation in the poset. You take a poset. What is the minimum requirement? Reflexivity. Therefore, you can't have that no two fellows are comparable. A fellow is comparable to himself first. Okay, at least that much will be there. So then on only that part of the diagonal you can take in that case. If you have only the diagonal, then you are taking parts of the diagonal. Okay, look at a matrix. Look at the diagonal. You can always write it in the form of a matrix. You see, there is various ways. If it is a discrete thing, you can write the whole relationship as a uh, 0, 1 matrix, etc., etc. Right. Is that clear? Any doubt? Now let me give you another example which is uh, useful for us in many ways. Okay? This part of it, I keep on coming back to this example again and again. Suppose I take R3 and I take R and I look at What does that mean? Where well, we started the class today. What does that mean? I'm looking at functions whose domain is a subset of R3 and whose co-domain is R. Okay. So I'm looking at this set. So look at all such functions. Now I am going to look at three functions. Look at F1. Okay. F1 has domain. That is what? The x axis. Of course, codomain is what? I do not have to write. All of them are the same codomain R. So, the only thing I have to say is what is the, what does that function do? So, the function maps any point in the domain to say 3x, I think this is what I use, 3a or 3x1. So, it is the map. It is a function. Now, look at f2. Domain of F2 to be x y 0. What is this? This is the x y plane. Now again, codomain is F2 of x y 0 is a 3x minus 4y. And then look at F3. With the domain, I am sorry, I should not write at this level. F3, domain of F3 to be the whole space. And then F3 of xyz to be 3x minus 4y plus z. Use the same z. Okay. Now, look at this partially ordered set. What does that mean? F is, this means what? F is a restriction of G. Now, you consider P1 to be consisting of three, three functions. That forms a chain. F1 is a restriction of F2. So, F1 and F2 are related. F1 is a restriction of F3, so F1 and F3 are related. F2 is a restriction of F3, therefore, if but how is that chain? If you have a chain, discrete, you can always write it as a. So F1 is a subset of F, uh, is a restriction of F2, F2 is a restriction of F3, and when you have the extension problem, the existence of an extension with certain properties is looking at this chain slowly. Uh, pulling it up. The whole proof of Anbana theorem is to make one step in the chain, the rest of it follows. The rest of it is essentially just looking at this chain. Okay? Uh, there are, uh, there is a very interesting theorem in the extension theorems. So, all that is why I am making a lot of pains to explain what extension means. Okay? So, 
you can now look at RN. If you had look, looked at RN, if you had started with just a one dimensional space and you had a linear uh, thing like 3x or nx or kx, then slowly you can pull it up to a linear thing on the whole space. So all you have to do is make one step at each step. If you tell how to go from one to uh, one dimension, you can increase, then you are finished. Next time you increase one more dimension, next time you increase one more dimension, next time you increase one more dimension. Since it is finite, you will reach at a finite. The problem comes in infinite dimension. How do you continue this process? And that is where all these theorems of axiom of choice, John's lemma, maximality principle, Turkish lemma, all these will come into the picture. Moving from 1 to 100 is easy. Somebody said, there is a famous uh, story that the golfer, your fellow was a caddy to a rich millionaire for several years and one day he asked him, sir, I have been helping you so long, tell me, do, can you tell me the secret of making a million dollars? He said, that's very simple. Then in that case you teach me. Can you make thousand dollars? He said, that's easy, sir. Do it thousand times. <laughs> so, the making that one step, then you can do two, three, four, hundred, thousand, it's very easy. But the problem comes, sir, how do I make infinite dollars? <laughs> do it infinite number of times. Then I can't finish it in lifetime. I can't even verify whether he's telling me the truth or not. So therefore, there I have to do that. Whenever you want to deal with infinity, never go on writing. Stop writing and think. <laughs> that, is, that is the secret of infinity. If you want to look at infinity, don't look outside, look inside. Into yourself, you will see the infinity. So, if you see it, you see it. If you don't see it, nobody can see it. Alright, so I think I will stop here and uh, next time I will carry on from chains, uh, several things, and then eventually my idea is to finish this set theory discussion with the axiom of starting.